Thank you for joining us for our extended version of Coffee with the Candidates. We're joined by Florida Governor Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis and with a panel of undecided Republican potential caucus goers from right here in Dallas County who have some questions for Governor DeSantis. Uh, Tim, we're going to start with you. You have a question about the national debt. Yeah, with the national debt higher than ever before at over $33 trillion, what are your plans to get spending under control and start going the other direction? And then my follow-up, is a national balance budget even possible based on the current situation we are in? I think it is possible. Um, I think if you look what Congress does, I mean, they, they jacked up spending during COVID and they've kind of just locked in a higher level of spending. I mean, they really, first of all, the COVID stuff was an overreaction. It was a mistake. It's driven, driven inflation through the roof. Uh, but to not go back and pare back is a huge mistake. You gotta be willing to veto the spending. But I'll tell you this, for the budget, the most pressing thing right now is getting interest rates and inflation low because the interest on the debt is ballooning because to service the debt, you're servicing at higher interest rates now. And that's gonna end up being a trillion dollars a year on the current course, which is more than our defense budget. So if you get it back down to where the rates are lower, you're gonna be able to service the debt in a more manageable way that will take a huge chunk uh, out of what we're spending every year. Yes, you got to work with Congress to do all the other stuff too, but, but that is like the number one problem. That is ballooning, and that's just not sustainable for our country. Quick question on that. You talk about, when you're talking about the southern border, a lot of times you talk about increasing uh, or using the military to deal with that and, and talking about the defense budget. How do you increase spending um, on America's defense without raising that national debt as well? Where do you cut? Well, part of it, yeah, I'm gonna reverse all of the Biden nonsense, which is like a 1.7 trillion. If you look what he did through the budget reconciliations he's done. So that gives us an ability to lock in the tax rates, reduce, uh, reduce the deficit, do the school choice, which is budget dust, and then do our military what we need. But I would also say our military, a lot of the money, like we have a massive bureaucracy in the Pentagon. I wanna slash that. There's so much bloat and waste that has nothing to do with war fighting. So you're talking about a potential dramatic reduction in the number of civilian employees uh, at the Pentagon, a dramatic reduction in some potentially flag and general officers, depending on where we are. Uh, we're gonna get rid of all the non-essential stuff in the military. I mean, you, know, you have a lot of what's going in the military. They're focused on uh, D, E, and I. They're focused on things like um, gender ideology. That is not what the military's mission is. So you're going to see some changes there. So yes, I, I, I'm going to want some hard power because we need to check China. We need to do some of this. I don't think the border is going to be very expensive at all. I think that'll be, that'll be relatively easy. But uh, we are not just going to add on top. We are going to take from some of the stuff in there because it's, it's the biggest bureaucracy. I'm going to actually audit the Pentagon. It's never been audited before. I'm going to do that. I'm going to start it on day one. We're going to audit the Pentagon uh, and you are going to see some, some changes there. Governor, thank you. We're going to go to uh, Chad next with a question about the supply chain. Uh, yeah, the, <clears throat> the pandemic exposed our vulnerability to an international supply chain. Um, how do we increase American manufacturing competitiveness uh, with lesser regulated foreign countries? So, um, well, one, I think you're going to have to have uh, some policies that are going to incentivize reshoring some of the supply chain because we've seen what's happened with China having such an inordinate amount of influence over international supply chains. That is not a good place for us to be in as a country. And so we will do that, and that's going to involve uh, some different types of levers that you pull. Uh, if you look domestically, what Biden wants to do with the Green New Deal, that makes it harder for American manufacturing to compete because they're gonna raise costs on, on everything and you're gonna to have to go to China to get what, some of the batteries for solar? Why would we wanna do that? So energy and, and expanding our energy here, lowering those prices, that is gonna help uh, us be able to manufacture better. The other thing we gotta do is invest in more skilled labor. I don't believe that everyone has to go to a four-year brick and ivy college. I mean, it works for some. We've got some great universities, but it's not the only pathway to success. In Florida, we, we're in the middle schools with, with some of the workforce. We're graduating kids that have a uh, uh, certification in aircraft maintenance, welding, all these things. They're getting good jobs. And so these are honorable professions. You're not any better than someone because you went to college and they didn't. In fact, how about all these kids that go to college, they get a degree in zombie studies and they're $100,000 in debt? That's not a great pathway, whereas some of these other kids, but I do think 
part of what you do to expand manufacturing, you gotta have a good business environment, low cost, but that skilled labor is important, and we've not done a good job of giving pathways to people. The more pathways you have, these businesses are gonna have folks that are gonna be able to do some of the stuff that's really, really important. Our next question is going to come from Jade on the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, uh, do you believe that Big Pharma has too much power in our country, and if so, what would you do to change that? A hundred percent. I mean, it's unbelievable. When you see the FDA approving a COVID MNRA shot on an emergency basis for six month old babies. Read the data on that. There was no data to show that that was beneficial. They did it, I think, because the FDA, who, who do those people go work for when they're done at the FDA? 95% go to work for big pharma. So you have this revolving door where the agencies have been captured by the industry and are effectively serving the industry rather than serving the public. So we're gonna go in and drain the whole medical swamp because if you look at COVID, they were wrong about the origin of the virus. They were either wrong or they lied about the origin of the virus, about lockdowns, about school closures, about forced masking, about uh, the efficacy of the shots, stopping infection. On and on you go, almost anything that came up, the elites were wrong. The bureaucrats were wrong. And so we're going to bring a reckoning to all these agencies, CDC, FDA, NIH. Uh, they are not serving this country well, uh, and, and we need to have some accountability because if we don't, they're going to do it again. And I think their subservience to pharma is a big part of that. And I think the way pharma has distorted medical delivery of medical services and the practice of medicine is, is absolutely there. I saw it during COVID, uh, the way people were, were, were behaving with this stuff. So we've got a lot of work to do there. And I think I'm the only one that has the, the ability or the, the willingness uh, to go and, and really make the big changes in those agencies. Because the thing is, you know, five years ago, if we were sitting here and you brought up an agency like the IRS, of course I wouldn't have liked that, right, as a conservative. But if you said CDC or NIH, I would have had confidence in them. And maybe that was misguided, maybe I just didn't know. But now, anything coming out of the CDC, I immediately take a grain of salt. The FDA, take it with a grain of salt. They have failed this country and, and we need accountability. Talking about health, maybe a different side of, of health, Tim has a question for you about mental health in America. Yeah, mental health has become a big issue in America that I'm sure you've seen firsthand with your background in the military. Uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of plan do you have to get veterans the help they need? Well, I think it's a really important issue. Uh, I saw this when I was in Iraq where we had some of these guys that had been deployed four or five times in a course of like four or five years. And that's just not a normal thing to be done. So yes, we unfortunately had people killed in action had many more wounded in action, our troops, um, and those, they're, they're heroes. And we've always recognized that, but I don't think we did a good job of recognizing that uh, people came back with invisible scars from, from the war. And that is a lot of the post-traumatic stress. It's driven a lot of veteran substance abuse and suicides. The VA just has not done a good job with this. Uh, and so we just have to understand this is a big bureaucracy. I don't know that you could ever get this bureaucracy to work in ways that are going to do justice to the veterans. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a model we did in Florida. Um, you go into the VA, uh, we're going to have a portal where every veterans charity can link in businesses, volunteers, uh, nonprofits. And so if a veteran has an issue with, say, mental health, goes in, you know, maybe the VA offers, but you're going to immediately have, like if you're here in Iowa, you have a, 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 an organization that helps veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. They're going to be able to come and they're going to be able to respond. Because what I found is the veteran, when I left active duty, they give you like a packet of like benefits and it's all bureaucracy. Like you can't make sense of it. So there's help out there. We need to link the veteran to all the help that's out there. And mental health is a big part. For example, in Florida, I've got, I've got groups, uh, these, these charities, they train service dogs to be able to work with veterans and help them cope with post-traumatic stress. When you, when you link them, because you know, you can pump someone with drugs all day long, that's not a solution for most of these guys. The veterans that have the service dogs, the suicide rate plummets. It's close to zero. Not zero, but it's close to zero. Well, let's do that, and it's even beyond that. You could have volunteers that are plugged into the portal. So if a veteran has issues, it may just be a neighbor showing up saying, you know what, I care about you. What can I do to help you? And just spending time with the veteran. There's so much goodwill out there and so much uh, energy and people wanting to help our veterans. We've got to use government not to solve every problem, which it can't do, but to link the veteran to all the resources that are out there. And I think mental health is, is at the top of that list. 
In our televised broadcast, we talked a little bit about farming and your plans on, on helping family farms. Uh, Chad has a question about farming. Yeah, there's a trend of corporate ownership of agricultural farmland. Uh, many of these corporations are foreign entities. Um, how do you allow family farms to con continue to thrive amid, amid this threat? Well, one, I, I think we mentioned on the broadcast, uh, there should not be a death tax for, for family farms. I mean, I want family farms to be able to pass the land down, pass the farm down, and keep it in the family. I think it's very important. When you force to sell, it adds to the corporatization, and that's not what we want to do, have government forcing that. We ban China, for example, and other countries of concern from buying any land in our state, but particularly the farmland. I think we need to do that nationally. I don't want China in Iowa gobbling up farmland. I think that's a national security risk. I think our food supply and food security is an important component of our national security. So this should be uh, American driven. And the more we have family farms leading the way, the easier it's going to be because these corporations, you know, they have investors from different places. You know, China's involved in some of this stuff. That's not a good road uh, for us to go. But I'd also say big government drives more of the corporatization because the bigger corporations they can deal with the rules and the regulations the burdens of the bureaucracy on the smaller farms that crushes uh, these smaller things so getting government off the back EPA uh, Department of Agriculture all the nonsense that people have to deal with we're gonna get that off your back and we're gonna let you do your job Our next question is gonna come from Tim about social media uh, yeah as a parent I'm concerned with social media's negative impact on children as a parent yourself, how do we keep our children safe with it now being an integral part of our everyday lives? I'll tell you, we have six, five, and three, and we have not given them any social media, but our kids can just grab my wife's phone or my, and they just know how to get on and start doing all this stuff. I mean, I'll walk into the, the living room and my, my son is five and he's just asking Siri about football scores and stuff like that. And he asks about every single NFL game every Saturday or every Sunday and all the college games on Saturday. So, um, but I think when you look at things like TikTok and stuff and, and, and the other social media, it is not good to have kids buried in this stuff for hours and hours a day. Uh, and so I think we need to empower parents to be able to have more tools at their disposal to be able to make decisions where they can make sure their kids are, are protected from some of that stuff. Um, you know, as, as parents, like my, my wife always jokes that um, our kids, when they're old enough, uh, they are not getting a smartphone, they're getting a flip phone. So if they need to get to the parents, they can flip it up and they can call. But we do not want them on that all the time. And I think, so it's interesting, I did a teacher's bill of rights in Florida uh, that we worked the legislature on. And, I, and I, when, I, when, I, when I announced it, I said, you know, what's wrong with going to class, putting your phone in a cubby, sitting in class, and actually doing it? And, you know, some of the left media was saying, oh, that's a fascist thing, all this stuff. And I'm like, give me a break. So we did it. One of our most liberal school districts in Central Florida, Orange County, they said no phones. And now they're reporting like kids are learning again and all this stuff. So I think in terms of like the school uh, systems, I don't think they should be on their phones at all. And whether that means put it in a cubby, you can use it at recess or just not allow it on, on at all. Uh, and that's not a federal decision, but that is clearly going in a better direction. And to have them buried in these things is not good. I also want kids to be interacting. You know, when I was a kid, we were outside. We were out playing baseball, playing football, doing all this stuff. And yes, we had video games and stuff. So it wasn't like we never did anything electronic. But to live and die on social media, that is not healthy for, for this country. And uh, we, will, we will empower parents to the extent we can, consistent with the law and the Constitution, for them to be able to make sure that their kids are, are having productive childhoods. When you were on the debate stage, there was a talk around TikTok and whether or not, if you were president, you would want to ban it. Uh, president Trump, when he was in office, uh, had talked about banning TikTok, but didn't actually do a ban. There's been talk about it in Congress. Do you think that's possible uh, from a federal, you know, can the federal government ban TikTok? And no, would you want to do that? I, I think you could, yeah. And I said, I said, I think it should be How because- How do you do it? Well, I think you'd probably need legislation. I don't think you can do it through executive order. I think you'd probably need legislation. And, but the issue is, is if you compare TikTok in America versus TikTok in China, it's wholesome in China. It's stuff that's actually not bad for kids. Here, China is, is putting poison into the bloodstream here to go, to go after our youth. There's no question that they're doing that. They're also taking the, the, the data 
uh, and they're mining the data of our own people. This is a hostile country. So I think this is, this is a unique situation where there are national, really serious national security risks. China is, at the end of the day, there's a lot of problems in the world. I mean, we see Hamas and Israel. We talked about the war in Europe. But China is really the only peer competitor that we have. It's the, the most significant threat to America's way of life because they have an economy that almost rivals ours. They have a military that almost rivals ours. You know, during the so Cold War, Soviet Union's economy was a fraction of our economy. Um, even during World War II, the Axis powers economy was, was not even close to the Allied powers economy. China is in it. Uh, they mean business. They want to be the dominant power in the entire world. They want to be able to dominate particularly the Pacific and the, the economy in the Pacific and with the shipping. And if they're able to do that, they're going to impose their worldview as a cost of doing business, social credit scores, internet policing, all these other things. So they have a very sophisticated view of how to get there. So things like TikTok, they go, for example, with the farmland. They set up things in, in universities called Confucius Institutes, which spread CCP propaganda. I eliminated that in Florida, but you have it in other states. So they use whatever crevice they can do to impose their will. They are doing that, and they've been very effective. So we just have to recognize that. We have to recognize that this is a significant issue, uh, and we should take action accordingly. And I think there'll be a lot of places in Congress. Now, Congress being what it is, as this debate has unfolded, some people have put out legislation which is like way, way overboard. I don't want to go overboard. I don't want a government regulating things that you're doing in America. Uh, I think it needs to be focused on something that's a foreign intelligence threat to this country. Thank you. Uh, Jade has our next question about election integrity. Yeah, I was just wondering what you would do as president to restore faith in our election integrity. Well, one, I can be here from Florida, show what we did. I mean, we, um, are, we were a laughing stock with elections 20 years ago with the 2000 hanging Chad. Uh, my election in 18, you had problems. I came in, I removed the supervisors from Palm Beach County and Broward down in South Florida. We enacted reforms to ban ballot harvesting, ban the use of Zuckerbucks, make sure there's universal voter ID and no mass mailing of ballots. And then we have, uh, even have an election crimes task force in state government that prosecutes people who violate election crime. So, so that's the model. It's going to be state driven. It's not going to be necessarily done through the federal government. But um, we will use the federal government to hold people accountable who are violating election law and committing some type of election fraud. We're going to be very aggressive at that. And what's happened in Florida, the fact that people know if you vote in two different jurisdictions, if you're an illegal alien, if you're a convicted uh, a rapist or something, and you're ineligible to vote, if you vote in Florida, we will identify and we are going to bring a case. And that's caused I think the problems to go down because if people know that there's a potential risk to them, they're not going to want to mess with it. Well, the reason why people do it in some of these states is because there's no penalty for doing it. So, so why not, right? That's going to change and we will have the Justice Department involved ensuring that our elections have integrity. And we only have a few minutes left. Tim has a question for you about taxes. Uh, my experience as a small business owner is that the current tax system has become so complex and inefficient that it bogs down a lot of our time and resources. What do you think you can do to help simplify the current tax system so we can focus more on things that help build our core business? Man, I, I think it should be like a single rate. I mean, you should be able to do it on a postcard. I mean, why are we doing all this stuff? It's a huge drag on the economy. Um, I think that the, the challenges are is that every page of the code has a constituency. It didn't just get there uh, through osmosis. Like, so, so when you're fighting on that, all the lobbyists come and they all try to defend their turf. So I think that's part of the reason why it is where it is. But yes, we should just have single rate. You should just know what it's going to be. And you should not even need to hire anybody uh, to do your taxes. You should just be able to do it. I, just as a wage earner, you know, as governor, I just get a salary, whatever. I have someone do my taxes because like, I, I, I cannot understand this tax code and I don't want to do anything where I'm committing some type of infraction. So we hire my wife and I hire people to do it. You should not have to do that um, as an American. It should be simple. It should be transparent. Well, we only have time for one last question. It's all going to come down to Chad who uh, has this one is, last This is going to be the most difficult question to get on the campaign trail. So your senior year at Yale, where'd you bat in the order? Third. And what was your uh, batting average? They say 336. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't even remember. So, but it was, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. I will say this: I threw out the first pitch a couple years ago at a little league game, and someone, my little league team, went to the little league World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and someone looked up the stats, and I didn't even remember this, but the second game we were in Williamsport, uh, I pitched 
struck out 12 people, got four hits, one home run, seven RBI. So I actually hit a home run at the Williamsport Stadium, which was really, really neat to be able to say that I did that. So that, uh, so I now remember what I, what I did in that game in Williamsport. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you so much. That's actually all the time that we have for our extended edition of Coffee with the Candidates. Governor, our panel, thank you so much for joining us.